Yeah, so thanks everybody for coming out to uh, talk about this. I'm already starting to move in front of the screen, which I was warned not to do. I'm pretty hyperkinetic in the way that I like to move around the stage. So this is gonna be a challenge for me. Uh, but we're here tonight to talk about developer productivity engineering, which is a, a vendorless practice of applying uh, various technologies to really try to increase developer joy uh, and, uh, and, and by way of that, increasing developer productivity. Right, so this isn't some new way to lean on developers to crank out more code. This is really more about using technology to improve the overall developer experience. Now, when I give this talk, it's usually to a polyglot audience. Uh, but right now, you know, Gradle obviously is very JVM centric, right? Um, there's some stuff that we can do around Webpack and JavaScript and all that, but I will not be afraid of, of talking about the Java specifics of this since this is, uh, this is AJUG. Uh, if you haven't, Heard of me before, a lot of you probably haven't. Uh, my name's uh, Justin Reoc, field CTO, uh, chief evangelist at Gradle. Been with Gradle for a little over a year at this point. Uh, my background is primarily in software development. I wrote code for, I mean, over 10 years of my career and then moved more into enterprise architecture and systems integration type of work, always focusing on a lot of open source and always with a bent towards really giving developers more avenues to, to be productive through the use of open source. So it was a really natural transition to come over here uh, to Gradle and start talking about uh, what we can do to, uh, to improve developer productivity. So our angle and really the way that we think about this is that it kind of starts here, all right? These kids look pretty happy. They're learning how to code. They probably feel a lot like a lot of us did, that's right, when we, when we got our first Hello World program working or something like that. Um, it's a joyous experience, it's euphoria, you know. I don't think enough is spoken about, about how the experience of writing code is both a highly creative, but also a scientific process. And the brain has been mapped while people are writing code. And it's amazing, all kinds of left brain, right brain activity happening. On the one hand, we're in a creative problem solving mode. On the other hand, we're then creating a hypothesis with the build tool chain. We're saying, does this code that I'm writing solve the problem, meet the goal that I'm trying to, to meet? So to set the stage here, I want you to think about what these kids might look like if it took 45 seconds, a minute, 10 minutes, an hour, 10 hours, 20 hours in some very extreme cases for these kids to get the feedback back from the build tool chain, right? Think about what that might do for their experience. They're not gonna look like that, right? <laughs> They're gonna be stressed out, frustrated. They're gonna be experiencing toil. They'll probably be thinking about another hobby. And the world has moved well beyond Hello World applications at this point. Some of you may have seen the statistic that was published back in, uh, by IDC back in uh, October of 2020. The prediction that, you know, with, with COVID being part of the acceleration for this, that the global GDP would be roughly 65% digitally transformed by now by this year, and that came true. 65% <laughs> or more of the global GDP is now digitally transformed. That is a lot of code, right? The most recent estimates that I've seen predict that we're about a million developers short of meeting all of the software needs that are kind of being generated right now. So this is serious business, and we have to really start thinking very seriously about developer experience. Some of you may have seen a, a few months ago uh, the remainder of the human genome, the, the, the remaining 8% of it was, was fully mapped. We now have 100% of the human genome mapped in the form of a digital twin that predictive models can be run against, right? Now, of course, this wasn't only a software advancement, but it's an example of how software lifts so many other boats in the harbor, right? We now have possibly the capability to run predictive models on our own DNA and be able to discover perhaps where the next novel pathogen might arise from that could possibly impact humans and what vaccine we should print years before it ever shows up in the wild. So the best code is written by happy developers, and we should strive to foster developer joy. I, I believe this is now a global responsibility. Uh, because software innovations are augmenting global innovation and solving some of the bi biggest challenges that we face so far. But instead, that's not the reality. <laughs> Enterprise software development is creating really a whole unique set of challenges for developers now. Um, kind of ironically, as a software project becomes more successful, right, as more developers are working on it, as we're increasing the number of repositories that we need to maintain the code, as we're increasing the number of dependencies, the feedback cycles get longer and longer. The build takes longer and longer. The test cycles take longer and longer. 
and it's deleterious to the overall uh, developer experience. And a lot of you who have been around uh, DevOps have probably seen this quote. Uh, it's becoming kind of canonized. Uh, this quote from Eric Pearson, the CIO of Intercontinental Hotels Group, that it's no longer the big beating the small, but the fast beating the slow. Okay, the landscape has changed. It's no longer the giant companies that are eating up everything. It's the fast, disruptive, and innovative companies that can get their products out to market the fastest and start creating throughput immediately. Until though, this is what most calendars still kind of look like, <laughs> right? So we start out the day, we're fresh, it's 8.30, we're coding, we're doing what we love, we're in a state of creative flow. We're in right brain, left brain activity, things are great, we're ecstatic until we have to wait for our build to complete. Now we're waiting for the local build to complete. And it failed. So now we're gonna spend the rest of the morning debugging some kind of build failure. We're gonna be scraping the console log, we're gonna be talking to build engineers, whatever it is in, in your developer group, going to all the different places to try to diagnose what went wrong with this. So then we'll fix it, maybe we'll go to lunch, we're frustrated, but now we're gonna go back to coding, we're good again. And we're gonna wait for our local build to complete, but this time it succeeds. We fixed it, great. We're ready to push it to CI where tests are flaky. And then we're gonna spend the rest of the day trying to figure out where our tests that we're passing in our local environment are failing in CI. Another way of looking at this is this pretty uh, famous comic. I think a lot of folks who are XKCD fans have probably seen this before. <laughs> uh, waiting on your code to compile is still considered legitimate work <laughs> in the software engineering space. And uh, I would argue that it's 2022 We've made a lot of advancements in other areas of removing frictions and, and, uh, friction and bottlenecks from the SDLC and from the experience of writing code. We can still do so much better here in the developer experience. And we're not just kind of spitballing on this. You know, we've run a lot of our, our own surveys and, and, and done some research to try to figure out you know, what were the pains that a lot of de uh, development groups were experiencing before implementing developer productivity engineering principles. Which, by the way, this is, you know, over the last five years have started to really uh, pick up a lot of steam. You have Netflix has their own developer productivity team now where they implement DPE practices. LinkedIn has an engineering team that's dedicated uh, just to developer productivity uh, and happiness. So does Spotify. In fact, they even call it their developer happiness uh, field. So it's relatively new even with the big Silicon Valley darlings, but it's really starting to pick up steam and sort of cross the chasm. So, you know, overwhelmingly, the, the, the people that we talked to about what they were experiencing before they started putting these practices in place, 92% said their biggest pain was too much time spent waiting on build and test feedback cycles either locally or during CI. And then not too far after that, the inability to easily, easily troubleshoot and determine the root cause of build, test, and CI failures, including things like flaky tests, right? There just isn't enough good tooling out there to really help us get to these answers. And um, you know, I don't wanna say that you know, problems being caused in the build are necessarily gonna take us out of a state of creative flow, because they're not. We're still solving problems in that space. But where it becomes bad is if we don't have good tooling to get the information that we need, and we just introduce a whole bunch of toil and frustration into the troubleshooting process. Then we don't look like those kids at the beginning anymore. We're, we're, we're stressed out, we're frustrated. So this is where developer productivity engineering comes in. And for all of that kind of theory and buildup, it's actually a super pragmatic approach, right? We're gonna use engineering, uh, and we're gonna use our engineering skills, we're gonna use technology to really uh, improve the developer experience. We're gonna use a combination of acceleration technologies that we recommend, as well as observation technologies. Um, just quick poll, this, this grows a little bit more uh, every time I ask this question, so I'm super curious. Who, whose company or whose development organization right now, just show of hands, is actually tracking metrics like local workstation build times, test feedback cycle times, common failures across the organization? We got one person, <laughs> okay? Now, this is kind of crazy, right? I mean, basic stuff like how long are developers sitting there wait for, uh, for, for builds to complete and yet no one's really looking at this. And what we know, of course, is that if it's not being observed, it's not being improved, right? If we're not measuring it, we don't have a way to improve it. So with a combination of speeding up these feedback cycles and then observing the developer experience uh, using these metrics, we then come up with this practice of developer productivity engineering, right? And we really think with the way that it's resonating and the types of uh, 
results that we're seeing in terms of increasing the throughput of a developer team while also decreasing its cost. Anybody who's familiar with the theory of constraints or how that translated into the Phoenix project is probably aware of the whole idea of the need to you know, decrease cost and increase throughput. We have to do both in order to improve a system. We can't just lay a bunch of people off and not touch our throughput. We may have controlled our costs a little bit more, but we're not producing at any, at any faster rate, right? We have to be able to do both of these things. And if you look at these predecessors to developer productivity engineering, if you look at practices that go all the way back to what I love to call the ancient business wisdom of the 1970s and 80s, <laughs> where Eli Goldratt was talking about theory of constraints and applying this to production, you can see how this principle has gone from just-in-time manufacturing to business process re-engineering, change management solutions all the way as we started applying these things to software and to uh, practices like Agile and Lean Six Sigma and then of course most recently DevOps. We really think that we can say pretty clear-eyed and full-throated that the consciousness of the industry is now shifting even further left in the process and looking at the developer experience. So the reason that this presentation is called the next big thing in software development we really mean that as the next big shift in consciousness for the industry, right? So it's not like you have to already be a DevOps mature organization to make these things work. You really don't. And you don't have to be a big Silicon Valley startup to, to, to have that work either, right? You really just have to be writing code. Um, not to belabor too much, but when you put these practices in place, they're felt at all layers of the organization. So it's not usually a very hard sell. Just, oh, I got a laser pointer. Look at that. Wonderful. Um, so obviously we're talking about very acute pains that are felt by software developers when we talk about feedback cycles and difficulty troubleshooting and inefficient troubleshooting and testing and CI. But if we look at what happens when we start solving some of these pains, then we start bubbling up to VP level initiatives and even C level initiatives within the company. You know, faster time to market, uh, more productivity, better resource efficiency. And if you think about it, if you're able to ask for feedback more frequently, if you're not feeling like, oh, I gotta cram in a ton of code because my build's gonna take 30 minutes and you know, I, I need to just get as much work in here as possible, when instead you're able to ask for feedback and you get it in 30 seconds, you know, a minute compared to that much longer build time, you're more likely to ask for feedback more often. You're more likely to introduce smaller change sets which has a direct impact on quality of service. And then of course this bubbles up to all the stuff that the C-suite loves, revenue costs and brand. So again, when you look at this practice, or if you're thinking, oh, I wanna be a hero and introduce this to my organization, it's not hard to sell this to your boss or your boss's boss. All right, before we dive into a little bit more of the tech, let's just be super clear about the different problems that we're solving here. Uh, if you can imagine that this, whoa. I don't know what just happened there. Okay, I hit the wrong button on this thing. I don't hit the monitor button. Um, if you can imagine that this is a developer uh, kind of going through their, their normal work, and these are feedback cycles that the developer's experiencing. And this developer happens to be in the local environment, uh, but this also extends to remote workstation environments and CI environments as well, although we have sort of a pet campaign at Gradle uh, called Build Local, almost like Buy Local, right? So we talk about how an efficient tool chain, you should be able to do all of your work uh, locally. So uh, sometimes things are fine. You know, sometimes things are, are chugging along and they're okay. Sometimes they take too long, right? We talked about that already. Build, build cycle times, test feedback cycle times. Sometimes they take too long to fix, okay? Sometimes the developer has not got the right type of tooling to be able to diagnose the issue. And then the worst one right here, the one that really keeps us up the most, problems and toil and friction and frustration that could have been prevented altogether if somebody had just been doing things like observing flaky tests across the development team or observing common failures. Hey, 100 developers experienced this failure 20 times a day over the last week. We should be aggregating that stuff. We should be looking at it so that we can make informed decisions about what problems we should be uh, focusing on. So the same survey, 81%. 81% of surveyed IT professionals said that introducing DPE practices to their work uh, made their job more enjoyable. Right? And we equate developer joy with developer productivity. Right? We really see that as the same thing. Right? Um, so starting to get into some of the actual pragmatism behind this, what do we recommend in terms of technologies across the board uh, to deal with these problems? Well, we, we've talked a lot about idle and wait time. We actually have three 
uh, technologies that we're recommending right now to improve the build and test feedback cycles. The first is called a build cache. And this is relatively new tech. If you're familiar with Gradle open source as a build tool, Gradle's had a cache built into it since 2017. Uh, our Gradle Enterprise product actually built, uh, brings that caching capability over to Maven. Uh, Bazel shipped with its own build cache, right? And there's a number of a distributed build cache. There's another, uh, a number of other uh, uh, build tools out there, Buck, things like that, that also provide caching. So we're gonna talk about that and talk about the difference between a build cache and like a dependency cache. So we're not talking about Artifactory, Sonotype Nexus, we're talking about a different technology here, but we'll dive into it a little bit. Test distribution, which is just what it sounds like. The ability to kick off test agents um, and allow them to run tests in parallel in an elastically auto-scaling way. Um, but what's key about the way that we recommend this is to not go kind of the CI fan out route, which if, you, if you're not familiar with that, we'll, we'll break that down. Uh, but rather be able to have this capability to distribute tests from the local environment. Again, build local wherever possible. The last one's predictive test selection. It's not on the slide yet. I need to add it. It was uh, introduced to, uh, to the tool chain relatively recently. It's a form of uh, using a gradient boosted machine learning model to look at test impact analysis in a different way and, uh, and, and scale down the number of tests that need to be run uh, on every build cycle. And then as we move to uh, kind of more chronic pains, uh, that are felt by organizations. We also look at this uh, inefficient troubleshooting. Uh, Gradle uh, and Maven, uh, and also Bazel, as of our December release, uh, we now have provided build scans as part of our free open source tooling uh, to all three of those, um, uh, th those build systems. Anybody ever run a, a Gradle build scan before? Sometimes you uh, got one over here. Um, you're doing Android development, right? Is that what I heard? Yeah. So. Uh, Gradle's kind of got it built into the open source tooling. You run a build, something fails, run dash dash scan for more information. And it pulls a whole bunch of like forensic details about the build. We like to refer to it as like an x-ray or an MRI of the entire build. Presents it in a nice UI. Everything from the console log to the dependencies, transit dependencies and, and likewise, failure information, tests, what happened with our testing. And then all of it is uh, shareable. Through a, through a nice kind of web UI. So if you wanna call out you know, a particular failure or a part of the console log and send that to a build or release engineer or somebody that maybe you were collaborating with to, uh, to try to troubleshoot, super easy to do that. Uh, failure analytics, again, moving to more chronic pains of the organization. This is what I hinted at before. Every failure that occurs uh, within the build that developers are experiencing should be moved to a central uh, place for aggregation. It should be easy for your organization to just have a dashboard that says, these are the most prominent failures that are wasting my developer's time. This is how long, on average, they have to wait to encounter that failure so that you can, where possible, start making proactive decisions about eliminating those failures from the build and, again, getting rid of those, those worst pains, the ones that could have been avoided altogether if we'd been a little bit more proactive. Uh, trends and insights. Not used to this pointer. My other pointer literally broke on the way over here. Um, so uh, trends and insights. So going back to the question about who's tracking local build times, who's tracking those metrics, you should be tracking those metrics, right? And if you're pulling in data uh, using the build scan, uh, then there's no reason why you can't do that, right? The build scan or whatever equivalent you, know, you end up thinking about putting in place for your, your organization uh, should be pulling that those types of metrics and they should be aggregating them and putting them on a chart. Why? Because it's not enough to speed up the build just once, right? We, we talked earlier about how the success of these projects can be deleterious, ironically, to the developer experience. We want to stay vigilant over this build health. It's not enough to apply caching technologies once and just think that things will stay fast, right? More dependencies are going to get added. Little things that are sometimes unexpected, an upgrade to endpoint security on your laptop. Suddenly your build's taking twice as long as it did before. These types of things go unreported all the time. We um, have sort of a champion of DPE over at Netflix. His name is Danny Thomas. There's a public interview with him, uh, which also turned into a blog article. And uh, he's responsible for developer productivity at Netflix, at least on the Android side of the house. And he said something in that interview that really, really stuck with me. And I like to kind of repeat it. He said, it is staggering the amount of toil and friction and frustration that engineers are willing to put up with, right? I mean, I think so much of us have be maybe become inured, numbed to these problems. We think about these things 
as just an occupational hazard of being a software developer, right? But sometimes it takes that little you know, prairie dog in the middle of the cube farm to say, hey, things don't have to be this way. <laughs> we can use technology to improve these, to improve the state of things. And now it's not really related to uh, productivity, but it's worth mentioning that any bit of work avoidance that we can manage through caching, through predictive test selection, through elimination of avoidable failures and flaky tests is going to have an impact on CI, right? It means that those CI builds will also not have to work as hard. So we see this interesting side effect sometimes where DPE gets put in place and suddenly CI build systems where people were used to agents queuing all the time and taking a long time just to pick up the jobs, all of a sudden agents are available everywhere because the CI systems aren't doing as much work and they cost less too. All right. So breaking down why very fast feedback cycles are important. I mean, I think we can all say with some level of confidence, yeah, it would be great for things to be faster, but let's kind of trace the, the cascading impacts of, of faster feedback cycles throughout an organization, right? Um, on the one hand, we know that uh, less and idle wait time, uh, less idle and wait time means less context switching, right? It means less, oh, gosh, I have to wait an hour, I'm gonna go play ping pong or something like that, or I'm gonna go answer some emails, or I'm gonna go do something else. I'm gonna pay the cost, the tax of a context switch. Now, a lot of us are very smart, and we love to believe that we can multitask and juggle lots of things at once, but the truth is we can't. Tons of, of research has been done on this over the last decade, where it looks at executive functioning, and most of us just sort of have the illusion that we can multitask, but we're really not focusing to our best. And over the last couple of years, even more research has come out and said, not only can we not multitask, it's actually unhealthy to try to force our brains to do that. It can actually be bad for our, our executive functioning to try to do this. There's another good case against Slack, by the way. <laughs> right? Um, so what do you end up with, with less context switching? More focused developers. And what are more focused developers? They are, they are happier because they are in their state of creative flow more often. They're in that nice ecstatic state where they're not experiencing toil and frustration. Uh, and so we're leading to a higher quality and a productivity out, uh, gain from this. But it doesn't stop there. I hinted at this a little bit earlier, but you know, it's, it's kind of intuitive. If you have faster feedback cycles, you can build more often, which means you're pushing smaller change sets into the system, which means fewer merge conflicts and more efficient troubleshooting and a faster mean time to resolve issues. Uh, earlier quality checks, we all know that finding bugs further left is what we all want to do. Uh, and so that leads to fewer expensive downstream inc incidents, which of course then has an impact on quality. So just doing this one thing, right, improving feedback cycles for our developers can have all of these cascading impacts, transformative impacts to the organization. Um, putting some math behind this and maybe, uh, you know, using some, some, some data to help us think about this. Uh, these are real statistics um, that were gathered from uh, a couple of smaller uh, Android teams that are, that are using Gradle Enterprises technology, full disclosure, but again, Gradle Enterprises is an enabling technology set for developer productivity engineering. We really try to be vendorless about this. Um, these teams who have started to do these things, like put uh, build caching and stuff like that in place, this team of 11 with a four minute build time roughly was able to perform about 850 uh, local builds every week, right? When we started tracking this data, this is what we looked at. This team of six, a little bit more than half the size, with a one minute build time, is running over a thousand local builds a week, right? They're able to ask for feedback 25% more often than this other team. They're able to refine their work more often than this other team. So there's a couple of stories here. First is, most people wouldn't complain about a four minute build time, <laughs> right? Again, we have extreme uh, uh, cases where our customers, the most extreme was over 20 hours. But even looking at Netflix, uh, Netflix's Android build was about a 64 minute total clean build um, before applying build caching and test distribution. It brought it down to four minutes, right? So going from you know, a, a 64 minute build time on the Android app down to four minutes has absolutely changed the way that they can do their development, right? Um, and so, uh, so, so, so thinking about a four minute build time uh, and saying, well, that's acceptable, that's okay, you have to think about the, the impact of what you could do if you could bring that down even further, right? So I think that the right mentality and, and one that kind of helps to guide some of these decisions is asking less often, oh, is it fast enough? Right? Are, are developers having a good enough developer experience? 
The DPE mindset is, is it as fast as it can possibly be given all acceleration and observation technologies, right? Is it as fast as it could possibly be? And I think that that's the attitude that we really owe our developers now in 2022. I think that's the experience that we owe them, and I think we can engineer that experience for them. All right, extrapolating a little further, a one minute build time for uh, this uh, same team of six brought down to 0.6 minutes, saves 44 engineering days a year, returns 44 days of engineering value a year back to this team, okay? Uh, for a team of six, that's a lot of time. That's almost two full vacation cycles for people. Uh, bringing this up to a larger scale, taking a nine minute build time down to five for a team of 100 running 12,000 local builds a week, returns 5,200 days of engineering value back to that team. Okay, and imagine what could be done with that. Not just writing more code, finally scheduling subject matter expert Fridays, actually getting behind what all businesses wanna do, giving their developers a day to just learn and focus on things as opposed to cranking out code. So there's a lot that could be done with that time that's been reclaimed. Okay, so a lot of theory. By the way, if there's any questions or anything, feel free to raise your hand. It's a, it's a nice, comfortable group here. You're not gonna, you're not gonna throw me. So, We've gotten through, I think, a lot of the theory, hopefully built the case. Now let's talk about the technology that can actually bring us here. Uh, so build caching uh, is uh, the, kind of the first technology that we're gonna look at. I think the most important thing uh, to, the, to, to take away from this uh, conversation is that we're not talking about a dependency cache. This is not Artifactory, this isn't Sonotype Nexus, this isn't something that's you know, caching dependencies locally for better bandwidth or supply chain security, any of those things that we know are important. Highly complementary to a dependency cache, we obviously recommend those patterns, but that's not what we're talking about here. Right? A build cache can actually cache individual phases and steps of the build. Right? So that's compiling, that's running tests, that's running check styles, that's compiling test harnesses, all these different things that make up the various stages of the build. What we can actually do is cache those and we can pull those inputs, or the, sorry, sorry, the outputs of those phases uh, from a cache as opposed to forcing our compiled or rerun them every time. Um, so uh, we can support both user local and remote caching for distributed teams. And again, this is just part of the open source uh, Gradle build tool. Uh, and it was introduced to the Java world by Gradle in 2017. But again, we are not the only uh, technology that has a build cache now. Plenty of build systems have build caches. Uh, Google's using them. Uh, uh, Bazel has a nice distributed build cache uh, built into it. Facebook's Buck build system also has build caching built in. So really the recommendation here is to, if you're not already using some type of build caching, take a look at your, uh, your tool chain and see if that, um, if that tooling is available to you. Because uh, out of the box, you're gonna see a lot of savings there. Um, basically, what are we saying here? The inputs to Gradle tasks are Maven goals. Can, we can generate a cache key based on those inputs to make sure that we're being very safe about what we're doing. And then we can take the outputs, which is usually just like a file tree of compiled classes or whatever the outputs of that part of the build were, and store that against those cache keys. What makes a cache key? Uh, well, it's just a hash of you know, source files that have changed, uh, JDK version, the class path, compiler arguments, right? So what we're doing is we're trying to generate a cryptographic key that tells us beyond a shadow of a doubt that the inputs that have gone into this part of the build are identical to some other time that they were run. Because it's uh, this kind of key caching uh, or key, uh, cache key based indexing, uh, it's very safe and it's stateless and it can also be done remotely, right? So of course we see nice benefits from running a local build cache, but we see even more benefits from a large distributed team that's able to use remote cache nodes, right? Uh, and we'll dive into this. I, I, I think we'll have time for, for a demo. I hope we'll have time for a demo. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that can be cached. So uh, Maven Surefire inputs, Gradle test inputs, test source files, runtime class batch, Java version, um, check style configuration, source files, right? There's a lot of different parts of the build that we can, uh, can benefit from caching. Just like any other you know, uh, type of, uh, of efficiency, uh, a cache is gonna perform better if you already have a modular build, right? So it's not that you won't get any out of the box savings, but if you've been pretty modular about the way that you put your project structure together, you will see more benefit, and I'll kind of illustrate that. So um, if you could imagine, actually kind of going back to, uh, to how we've, um, how we've uh, configured this project, you see that we've got a, uh, this, this, this overall project with four modules in it, right? We've got our core module, a service module, web app, and an export API. And if we kind of put this on a chart 
and uh, kind of just understand where the dependency chain is here. Our core module is uh, depended on from service and export API. Nothing depends on export API. The web app depends on service, but nothing depends on web app. Okay, that's kind of what we're setting up here. Now, under normal circumstances, if we were to go run um, you know, a Maven uh, clean build or a full build here, everything has to get compiled. Uh, and for Gradle, this is even the case with a clean build, right? Now, for those of you who are familiar with the Gradle build system, you understand that it's an incremental build system. You can save time using up-to-date tasks already, but that doesn't apply to clean builds. That doesn't apply to like the first build of the day, where you know, maybe you've you know, pulled new features or something that your follow the sun team was working on overnight. So first build of the day, uh, everything is gonna usually have to build. So if we turn on caching and we change a public method in the export API module, up here, we can see that we'll have to run our test compile again, and we'll have to run our test again. We'll check style it, let's say that's part of the build. But that's it, nothing else depends on export API. So all of these other parts of the build can be pulled from cache. Um, if we change a public method again in the service uh, module here, uh, well, we'll have to run our test compile and our test and our check style against it. And because web app depends on this, We'll have to compile our test harness and we'll have to run our test again here, but we won't have to check style anything in the web app because we didn't change any code there, right? So we could pull the output of that task from cache if we wanted to. Um, what if we change an implementation detail as opposed to a public method in the, uh, in the service module? Uh, in that case, we didn't change any public methods, so the only thing that has to run here is a check style of this source code and the test, and of course, because this depends on it, the test has to run against it but we don't have to recompile the web app, we don't have to compile our test harness, and we don't have to do anything here on the dependent module, and of course we don't have to do anything on the modules that aren't dependent on this as well. All right, so just a number of different scenarios to kind of understand how that changes build behavior, right, and how it's done kind of safely. And of course all this can and should be done remotely for larger teams, right? So as opposed to uh, local builds feeding a local cache, you can have CI feeding a remote cache that then lots of developers can read from. Right, and that way you don't have, you know, whatever, whatever your team is, you know, thousands of developers trying to hit the same remote cache node uh, and actually just slowing that thing down. You have changes checked into CI and CI populating that cache and then local developers able to read from that remote cache. This is again all about that first build of the day, right? By being able to benefit from the cache that's been populated by other developers in your organization, follow the sun or whatever, uh, you can then benefit from whatever they've populated the cache with because we've got kind of this elegant key caching solution that we recommend. Okay, uh, questions on that? Pretty straightforward, right? Cool. Uh, build scan uh, is kind of what we recommend for troubleshooting. Uh, again, this is part of the open source tooling. You can go to scans.gradle.com right now, uh, or if you can run your Gradle build with a dash dash scan, you can execute a build scan right now. But we've also made this technology available for free uh, for Maven, uh, and also for uh, Bazel builds. We provide a build scan for, for Bazel as well. We just uh, kind of debuted that one actually at Bazel Exchange, uh, which is the remote conference going on uh, today. It, it ended this afternoon. Speeds up troubleshooting by basically providing this comprehensive shareable build summary. Again, kind of like an x-ray of your build. Uh, it's easy to spot bugs, failure details, and all these things. And then uh, just as easily, you know, uh, developers can turn around, take parts of this scan, share it over Slack, direct some, somebody else that they're collaborating with directly to this part of the build, give them the information that they need to, uh, to troubleshoot. Uh, and again, it's uh, available now for Gradle, Maven, and Bazel. Um, test distribution can help us make tests uh, even faster. So, um, you know, the idea here is that we're trying to build on these various acceleration technologies, right? We're trying to create force multipliers by using multiple acceleration technologies at once. So caching helps certainly uh, avoid work that doesn't need to be repeated, but what about work that does have to be repeated, right? What about tests specifically where, okay, now we changed something legitimate and now we have to, now we have to rerun these tests. Well, the next thing you wanna do is distribute those tests in parallel, right? And, and CI fanout has been kind of the premier way to do this. In other words, partitioning your test sets in CI and then having them run small sections of those in parallel, or even seeing people do kind of manual test partitioning where it's like, okay, I'm gonna turn off these tests by myself because I know that, that you know, this isn't affected by the code that I did. Hopefully the caching can take care of that for you, but if it can't, 
then you should be able to distribute these tests across agents. And again, in our opinion, you should be able to do this locally. You shouldn't have to re rely on CI uh, for this to happen. So in our case, what we've got are um, JUnit 5 compatible test agents that are running in Docker images and that we recommend deploying inside of Kubernetes, of course, uh, using um, KEDA uh, horizontal pod auto scalers. There's, there's no reason to reinvent reinvent Elastic Auto Scale when we've already got that working really, really well uh, in, in Kubernetes. Um, but the, the build client should be attached directly to uh, these test agents so that, again, you can experience this uh, locally. Um, existing solutions are, are, are there, right? Single machine parallelism. If you're familiar with Bazel, Gradle, uh, maybe plugins for Maven. Uh, I'm not sure, actually. Say again? Do you, and uh, are you able to do um, test parallelism with Maven? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I can't, I can't put my finger on what it is, but with Gradle, you can set uh, any number of parallel workers that are going to go and um, you know run your tests for you within your local environment. But that's a single machine, right? There's going to be a ceiling, right? You're only going to be able to take that so far. Um, with CI fanout, you know, this kind of solution where we're going to have multiple build steps and we're saying run this test group here, run this test group here, run this test group over here. Okay, better, but we're still relying on CI, right? We're still making our developers check our stuff into, their stuff into CI uh, to be able to take advantage of that parallelism, right? Well, again, build local, right? Make your technologies... Uh, help with the local developer experience so that they can get that feedback as fast as possible. Um, so, you know, again, this, is, this acts as a force multiplier for the, the caching technology, right? So we're able to hopefully avoid some work, but any tests that we still have to run, we can put into these um, parallel kind of uh, worker threads and um, achieve, you know, these types of results. Um, this was... Uh, I keep wanting to get close to that screen, man. <laughs> um, these uh, are just sort of, uh, you know, watching the ramp up happen as we increase the number of remote workers that we can apply. So, you know, we start with just kind of, you know, one local, zero remote. Uh, two local helps us, but we, and we will see diminishing returns over time. That's just how scaling is going to work. Um, but the thing is to try to find, again, the optimal set of remote workers that are going to be able to execute your tests for you uh, to make things as fast as possible. And then, of course, machine learning has helped lead us to even greater efficiencies here. Um, anybody heard of predictive test selection? It's, it's, it's pretty new. Um, uh, I think it was kind of uh, incubated in the Microsoft, Google, Facebook academia circles for a long time. Facebook was the first one to publish a paper on it back in 2019. Um, the idea is to be able to take a learning model to look at a history of changes that have been made uh, to the source and try to predict based on that which tests are actually going to change their feedback, right? So I have 20,000 tests that have to be executed. But based on these source code changes and looking at a history of those source code changes, only 10 of these have any likelihood of switching from failure to success or success to failure, or potentially flaky, flaky too, which we want to know about, right? So we use a gradient-boosted model, uh, which is also the, the model that, that, that Facebook recommended. And we're actually using an adversarial model with, with, uh, with, with several different models to make ours pretty accurate. We're seeing anywhere from a 99 uh, point, a 99, uh, sorry, 95 to a 99 and a half percent confidence on the, uh, the scores that we're predicting with this. And we got there to know a little bit about the sausages made, because if you've seen some of these other solutions, sometimes they're hitting like an 80, 85 percent confidence. A lot of those uh, models are being trained on flaky tests, right? Which we, we know this about machine learning, garbage in, garbage out, just like anything else, right? So if we're sitting there trying to train a model on a test that's non-deterministic, sometimes it succeeds, sometimes it's failed, we're going to end up with a poorly trained model. But because we have another solution that does flaky test detection, because that flaky test detection is part of what we recommend, we're able to eliminate those types of tests from the training model first and only train the model on tests that, that we know are reliable which brings us to these really high numbers. Micronaut and the Micronaut Foundation, Foundation has been using our stuff for uh, a few months at this point, and they are seeing a 99.5% confidence. Um, and what this really looks like, the whole workflow, is that uh, 
you know, we have our test build, we have the normal test, uh, set of tests that would be sent out, we throw it through this predictive test selection model and look at the change in test history, and the ML model is gonna select, again, tests that it thinks are actually gonna be interesting. Yeah, I got a question? That's a great question. So our model comes pre-trained on a lot of different open source projects, and that's one of several models that's actually involved in the prediction. And then the, 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 the uh, test retrains, or the, uh, the model retrains every time a new build is run. Um, we're seeing most of our users need anywhere from like a two to four week lead up time even after, or training time even after using our pre-trained model to start hitting those high confidence numbers. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, again, gradient boosting is different than a deep neural model, right? Gradient boosting is not a deep neural, uh, deep neural model. We didn't, want our, um, we didn't want our users to have to install a GPU to, <laughs> to, to use our product and use our model. Uh, gradient boosting is, uh, gradient boosted models are based way more on like a decision tree. And so they do require data, but they don't require nearly as much data as a deep learning model does. Um, does that answer your question? Kind of. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know that you could put an exact, I mean, I'm sure you could. Uh, I mean, I'm thinking through, you know, the, the customers and the, uh, the open source projects that are using our technology now. We got 30 or 40 of them in the wild that are training this model at the moment. I mean, they range in complexity from, um, you know, Spring, that they've been using our stuff, Micronaut and, and the whole Micronaut Foundation and all of their underlying projects. Uh, they've been using it and they've been able to ramp their models in, uh, in that two to four week period. Um, thinking about simpler projects, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know. I, um, I mean, I, to, to, to get enough training data in there to hit those confidence scores, you know. Well, I mean, we can even, here, I'll, we can take a quick look at, uh, you know, one of the projects that's been really successful with this. Um, Let's look at Micronaut, and let's, let's just take a look at what they're, you know, how much data they've used to feed this thing. Um, so here's their kind of predicted test selection uh, dashboard. Um, they're at a 99.5% confidence right now. And in the last 90 days, they have run well, well over 10,000 builds. Let's just see uh, in 28 days what they've run. Over 10,000 builds in the last 28 days as well. Let's see what they've done in the last week. Yep, just 10,000 builds. You guys are building a lot. <laughs> uh, so let's, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, that, you know, I mean, if you're doing, if you're doing a project that, you know, doesn't have 20,000 tests or something like that, you might not even need predictive, right? I mean, caching and test distribution might be all you need, right? Um, but, you know, if you're doing, like Micronaut is doing, you know, 10,000 builds a, a week here with a lot of tests, you know, you can see where you extrapolate a lot of avoidance savings from, uh, from, from using that. It's a good question. I'll, I'll try to get more information on it. I can speak to uh, kind of the uh, data architect that put it in place for us. All right. So that's acceleration, right? So kind of three force multipliers there, caching, and then whatever can't be, uh, can't be uh, avoided through caching, uh, we want to apply a predictive model, and then whatever we still have to run should be distributed, right? Um, but it doesn't end here. Yeah, I love this quote by uh, Yogi Berra. It's so straightforward, um, and also I think says so much and so little. You can observe a lot just by watching. Going back to the, the one hand that was raised about observing the local build time metrics and things like that, I think that there's a lot more we can observe. Um, you know, again, we talked a little bit about this, but regressions are pretty easy to reintroduce back into the build, right? There's, there's all these different things that can slow the build down again. Uh, going back to the toil that a lot of developers are willing to put up with, you know, endpoint security updates, new version of an annotation processor. Suddenly the build is taking 25% longer than it was before. Is that really going to get reported necessarily, right? Or are developers going to say, oh, that sucks. The build's taking longer than it used to. Oh, well, I guess I'll take a longer coffee break. <laughs> but um, being able to actually put these things on, on some type of trending dashboard where we can see the curves change. Oh, the build was taking five minutes. Now it's eight. What happened? 
You know, let's, let's dig into that um, because there are so many things that can, that can reintroduce these. So really the last uh, couple of, of points that we talk about here are our failure analytics and our trends and insights. Um, with with uh, failure analytics, um, we kind of treat both, uh, you know, the ability to put on a dashboard common failures that are being felt across the entire organization, but then be able to use data to say, no, these are really the most impactful. Because you might have just one loud developer who's frustrated and says, oh, this problem is horrible, we need to fix it. But then you go look at the dashboard, and maybe they're the only developer who's experiencing that problem across, across the entire team. Or maybe they're experiencing it, but they're only experiencing it like once a week, right? We can actually, instead of going anecdotal with the way that we think problems are impacting the build, we can put it on a dashboard and we can figure it out. And we can do the same thing with flaky tests, right? Um, this quote does not come from us. This is from Spotify on a blog that they wrote about flaky tests, uh, where they called flaky tests the pit of infinite sorrow for developers because they impact the developer experience in so many ways. I mean, first of all, you can't rely on the test bed if you know that these tests are sometimes non-deterministic, right? So you'll find yourself rerunning tests and not necessarily having confidence in their outcomes. Um, on top of that, what's the basic psychology? Oh, the test failed. Let me run it again. Oh, it succeeded, great. Push it to CI, we're done, right? But Spotify in this blog can actually show you data where it says, anytime you're experiencing jankiness in their app that is not related maybe to bandwidth, it's probably related to a flaky test that wasn't dealt with. So our own development teams, uh, the Gradle Build Tool team and the Gradle Enterprise team, they schedule flaky test days. Once a month, they open up the flaky test dashboard, they sort by test flakiness, and they just start proactively dealing with the, uh, the, the tests that are flaky the highest percentage of times. Um, and failure analytics is kind of the same thing, right? We're going to um, try to, again, put on a dashboard um, avoidable failures that we can proactively do something about. Okay. So kind of putting all this together, and I think we will actually have time for, um, for a demo here. Um, you know, we think that DPE will become standard practice. We see it becoming standard practice. We see it beginning to cross the chasm because we're in a place now where we have a responsibility to foster developer joy, and we can do that using technology, right? By thinking differently about the way that we uh, treat the developer experience. Um, the best DPE organizations who are doing this well right now, this is a little bit different than what we see with DevOps teams where the recommendation is to automate, automate, automate and get rid of humans um, in some cases. Uh, what we're actually seeing in these, uh, the companies that have done the best with DPE is that they're forming sort of centers of excellence around developer productivity, right? Instead of making it the part-time job of some developer lead to focus on productivity, to spend a few hours a week or whatever, we're actually recommending a central team look at these metrics, be responsible for the metrics, make sure that they're cascading practices down to the rest of the organization, and then using all this data to ensure that the actions they're taking are, are making an impact, right? That we actually are improving the experience for developers. So again, just some examples here. But I, I, I also don't want to paint a picture that it's only like these big Silicon Valley corporations that, that, are, that are benefiting from this. They were just kind of the first ones to start focusing on it. Right? They had the need. Uh, well, you can horizontally scale your developer team so much, but I mean, we all know <laughs> the pay scale of some of these really lead engineers that are, that are working for Silicon Valley companies. Um, we know how expensive they can be, right? And so to be able to vertically scale their capabilities is also very important, especially if we can do it by making the developer experience better. Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, we do have a whole uh, kind of learning center that's dedicated uh, to these practices. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, good free material. Again, we try as hard as we can to be vendorless about this. I mean, you know, of course we have a product, um, but that product is very JVM centric and there are plenty of other platforms and, uh, and, 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 and teams that can uh, benefit from these practices, you know, well beyond what we can do with the JVM. So you'll see all kinds of stuff in here, uh, anything from uh, what we call our dev prod eng lowdown and showdown events. These are like, um, you know, the, the showdown is kind of fun. We've got one guy on the team who's a, you, some, some people, I'm not a sports person, but there's a show on ESPN where basically, you know, people talk about what's happening in sports. You bring in experts 
And then the audience can vote on kind of who they think gives the best commentary about those, uh, th those various sporting events. We built the same thing except for developer productivity, right? So we'll kind of take luminaries from uh, various uh, developer teams and, and companies and we'll ask them some questions and the audience can vote on who they thought kind of gave the best commentary. So we've got that in here. The lowdowns are more like fireside chats. I mentioned the one with, with Netflix that's out there if you want to learn about what Netflix is doing in this realm. We also had a great one with Meta, Facebook, who will never be a Gradle Enterprise customer. I mean, they're using buck build system. They're, they're going to try to, as, as Facebook likes to put it, clever their way out of everything, right? Um, so, is that a, I'm sorry, is that a question in the back? I'm, no, okay. Um, so, uh, so the Meta Facebook one is really super interesting. A guy named Adam McCormick who has, he may be dealing with like the worst developer productivity in the, in, in the world or developer, developer productivity problem in the world which is Meta's ginormous monorepo. You know, for those who aren't familiar with Facebook's practices, every single bit of Facebook software lives in a single repository that they have a modified version of Ant that they're using to, to manage, right? And it's crazy the way that they've actually been able to make it work. But to his point, clever their way out of everything is the kind of, it's, it's a great interview. Uh, we have a book and uh, the Gradle logo is featured here, and you won't see Gradle mentioned for the rest of this book. 81 pages of uh, vendor agnostic practice, uh, case studies, uh, everything that we have gathered uh, in our time kind of being in this space, um, you know, available and, and kind of made available for you. It's one of these things where if you feel like maybe you missed the boat with DevOps, you know, or you're looking at what you know, the people who came and brought DevOps practices into your business have been able to achieve for the business and kind of the heroes that they've become most likely. Uh, good news, there's an opportunity to do it again in the form of bringing developer productivity engineering practices into your organization as well. Uh, and then of course we have a number of open source projects that use our technology for free. I showed you Micronauts dashboard. Um, there are some other ones. And um, that's, that's it. So um, it's, it's eight o'clock, so I, we're not too far past um, uh, uh, my allotted time here. So I do want to just show a couple of demos, maybe to make this thing a little bit more real. Um, first, let's kind of look at uh, some build caching examples. Um, so well, let's do Maven. Oh, actually, show of hands. Uh, how many people are using Maven? How many people are using Gradle? Okay, we'll do them both. That's actually a pretty good split. <laughs> Um, so let's take a look at Maven first. Now this is, um, yeah, I know, Copilot went GA today and it won't stop bugging me. Um, this is, how does that look? That's pretty good. This is just, a, I mean, it's a sample Maven project, but I like to use this project because it, it does a lot of things and it compiles pretty quickly. Um, anyone who's familiar with Apache Camel, I'm a huge fan of Apache Camel for doing integration work. Uh, and this is an example camel project that spins up a fluent, what's called a fluent builder pattern, right? So it's taking camel syntax, it's generating, it's using spring to generate uh, real code from that, uh, and then it's running some unit tests. So let's blow away my local cache because I think I've already got this, uh, um, I've already got caches running, or I've already got a lot of cache data in here from the last time I did this demo. So that's safe, right? Yes? Um, let's also purge the remote cache because I, I mentioned that all this can be done with a remote cache node as well. Yikes. So I'm just, we, you know, we have a built-in node in our product. I'm just purging it to make sure that nothing interferes. And then I'm going to run this build from, uh, from scratch. We're just going to do a Maven clean verify. And we're running our tests, doing our thing. Okay, and so we had um, a total of four tests run, and uh, did I turn caching off here? Sorry about that, I was testing. Uh, Maven's got an open source uh, build cache that I was testing out as well. It's, it's not generally available yet. Um, so sorry about that, I gotta turn this extension back on. All right.
And this, this uh, extension, by the way, is just living in Maven Central. So, you know, to, to try this out, you don't have to have a license or anything. Okay, so we've got eight goals that were part of this build. We executed eight of them. By the way, this is what the build scans look like as well. Uh, we won't go through every single part of this, um, but this was just generated off of this build for Maven. Uh, you can see that we've got the console log in here. Uh, so we can refer to this. We can filter down if we want to just see what was happening with various goals in the build as opposed to picking through the whole thing. You know, if we have a particular goal name that we want to drill down to here, if we just want to see what happened with our tests, for instance, we can do that. If we want to um, share any part of this, right? Maybe we, uh, I don't know, this debug statement is really important for some reason. We can create a link from this, pop it into Slack or whatever and take somebody right to the same part of the interface, right? So just kind of easy to share stuff with people. Uh, and we can also kind of see what happened with performance, so we can see what happened with our build cache. Of course, we missed the cache because this is the first time we populated it, um, but we also were able to store stuff. Cool, so we stored stuff on three of the goals. Obviously, not every goal is gonna be able to be cached, right? Some of these are IO tasks, packaging, clean, delete operations, you're never gonna be able to cache those things. But what, what can we do here? Well, let's run this again. And that was about a 10 second build time, by the way, just to help extrapolate a little bit. And now we finished in three seconds instead. About a 70% savings on a 10 second build <laughs> um, uh, by, by making use of a, of a local cache node here. Um, we could also do this with a remote cache. Um, you know, Jenkins uh, or whatever our CI is, you know, can, can run the same build and populate it. Notice be that this is all tied to the build tool itself, right? This is tied directly to the build tool as opposed to being tied to some CI extension or something. So it's very flexible, right? Anytime you can run Maven, anytime you can run Gradle, you, you can benefit from this. Um, so looking at uh, what we can do then with uh, Gradle, and we'll just run a local cache. Uh, all right, Copilot, I get it, you're available. Um, let's take a look at just what we can do with a local cache node with Gradle as well. And uh, let's blow away our, our cache as well. We're gonna have a different cache for our Gradle builds. And let's, uh, we, wouldn't have, we wouldn't have stored anything. Oh, that's not true actually. I, I, oh no, we purged everything, so we're good there. So I'm gonna do a Gradle clean build here. Okay, five executed tasks. Um, the build scan for Gradle is gonna be, uh, um, which one is this? Uh, the build scan for Gradle is gonna be uh, a little bit different looking uh, just because it's within the Gradle vernacular, right? We're not, we're not dealing with goals, we're dealing with tasks, you know? Uh, we have build dependencies that'll be part of Gradle. Um, but let's just kind of jump right to what we have in our performance here as well. Uh, missed the cache, fine. Did we store? Yes, we did. No surprise here if we run this again. Those tasks that were cached, I mean, that was instant. We, we finished our build in, in less than a second. 580 milliseconds pulling the stuff from cache. Okay, um, I think we have time to look at one other thing. Let's take a look at test distribution. So a test distribution, um, I've just got all of this stuff running uh, in a Minikube instance. And if we take a look at this deployment, it's, it's very straightforward. Uh, we have this test distribution agent, which is distributed as a jar file or a Docker image. Um, we've got it uh, deployed inside of Kubernetes, and we have a KEDA horizontal pod out of scalar applied to this thing, right here. And we're saying, you know, set this max replicas up to 100, basically. Um, Depending on how long this thing actually runs, sometimes it doesn't hit the auto scale, but you'll still get a you'll still get an idea of um, of what's what's kind of happening here. Uh, the first thing we'll want to do is just kind of turn this off, right? Let's let's see what happens when we run this test set, uh, which is a, um, a test suite of around a thousand tests.
And I'm not going to sit here and, and you know, wait for all of this to execute. But I, I just want to point out that all this is happening, uh, that all this will be happening locally. We're not doing any crazy CI tricks or anything like that. So we're, you know, getting 20 seconds in somewhat. And, you know, we've, we've completed about a third of our tests. So, okay, so that's kind of normal. Let's kill that. And let's turn on distribution. We'll run a, another Gradle clean build here. And what we should be seeing, oh. So one little quirk about how this works is that these um, test agents are going to have, um, you know, because they're, they're, they're test agents that are built around JUnit, uh, they're gonna have capabilities. Right, so we have these agents, uh, this one agent deploy right, deployed right here, and we can see that its capability is to run builds for JDK 11. And I always forget to uh, set this to what it needs to be because I'm probably on oh, JDK uh, 17, which I am. So we're gonna set this to Java 11. We're gonna try this again. Excellent. Now we're distributing these tests to uh, the agents that are living in Kubernetes. Now, because we set this for auto scale, you know, we're going to have to wait for the Kita auto scaler to actually take over and bump up the number of pods. Because right now there's only one agent that's currently serving this. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. It depends actually a lot on bandwidth and uh, how my computer is behaving. But we, oh, we can already see this though. Great. You can see that we've got uh, different UUIDs generated for uh, these various agents. Um, so we've now distributed that across multiple agents. And if you did the math before, it took about 30 seconds or so to get through a third of our tests on the last run. And we just got through all of our tests in 42 seconds. And that was waiting for Kubernetes to kick in uh, and actually do its auto scaling. We could also just take advantage of normal, uh, you know, Kubernetes kind of inbuilt uh, scaling stuff and just tell it to scale up at the beginning if we'd rather do that. All right, I think that's, um, that's kind of it. The, the, the last thing I would point out is that if you, you kind of want to see what some open source projects are doing with this, um, we do have this open source project set. Uh, a lot of these open source projects are, are using this technology for free, so it's you know, a better way to go in, get a little bit of a refresher about what you learned today, take a look at some other build scans. If you have an open source project and you're interested uh, in using any of this, let us, let us know, right? We're, we're, we're very open to that. Our, our roots are obviously in, in open source and we want to give back as much as we can. All right, I think that's it. Any other questions, thoughts? We ready to go to Taco Mac and drink some beer and eat some wings? <laughs> For personal projects? Um, so the stuff that you saw that was like the build scan and the Gradle caching, um, all of that stuff is part of the open source build tool. So absolutely you can. Um, to look at some of the other stuff like the, 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 the flaky tests and failure analytics and all those kinds of things, to use our solution that is part of, the, part of the commercial solution. But nothing that we've built here, you know, are patterns that you couldn't establish on your own. What I, what I really hope that people kind of leave with is that there's still a lot that, that we can do in terms of observing what's going on with our builds and a lot of existing technology that we can put in place to make that faster. So, you know, of course, Gradle Enterprise is, you know, turn, turnkey solution for some of this stuff, but, you know, it's not the only solution. Um, to, to be completely frank, it is just as much my job to go around and evangelize this practice of DPE as it is to try to help you know, our, our sellers sell our product because we want to legitimize this space you know, to give us a little bit of an insight into our strategy. If we want you know, Gradle Enterprise to, and, and DPE you know, to be something really, really relevant, we need a lot of competitors. Right? We can't go and convince Gartner to do an MQ on developer productivity engineering if it's just us sitting lonely in that space, right? Um, and frankly, you know, Gradle is still a very JVM-focused company. I don't think that if we started to write like a C -sharp .NET solution or something that would work well for you know, JavaScript or something, you know, or Node or any of these other technologies, I don't think we'd be very good at it. 
So I would actually much rather see you know, other people take a look at these practices and start putting together their own projects. We've actually seen you know, direct evidence of that because you can build uh, native using Gradle. There's a number of extensions that are available. So we actually have customers who are using uh, our technology on native builds and seeing a lot of the same, um, the same results that I kind of shared with you here on, on more JVM-centric builds. So absolutely, it can make an impact. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, the question is, can you use the, 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 the Maven uh, build cache if you're not using Gradle Enterprise? Not right now, no. <laughs> uh, it's, that's what enables the Maven caching. But you probably saw on my laptop uh, that Maven is in the middle of developing their own build cache right now, and I'm kind of keeping an eye on, on their progress. Uh, there's some indication that the community has been ramping up those efforts pretty recently. Uh, so I would keep an eye on that. It's just, uh, if you go to... Uh, let's see, it's the, whoop, getting low on battery here. Maven build cache extension. They've already got, you know, the documentation and the project overview and everything like this in, in, in place. Um, so I would keep an eye on this. Um, you know, at the end of the day, goal caching, it's, it's not rocket science, and it, it really wouldn't surprise me to see uh, the Maven community spin out something really valuable here. Yeah, it's still a snap. Oh, I mean, it's, it's not ready yet. <laughs> it's not even, the, the, the extension is not even sitting in Maven Central. You have to go and request a jar for, follow from them if you want to try to use it right now or build it from source. Um, so yeah, it's not generally available. It's not ready yet. But I, you know, every indication is will, will be that it is. The community is actively working on it. Last I checked on it was a few days ago and there was a commit from maybe three days before that. So it is being actively worked on. All right, well thanks everybody for the participation, the questions and everything. I also have Gradle stickers. I know some of you who came early uh, already, already grabbed some, but I've got, uh, um, and I have plenty more than this too uh, if, we, if we run out, but I've got the old school Gradle logo, um, you know, and kind of the old Gradle sticker, sticker here, and we've got our newer design, which is like our teal gradient uh, elephant without the, uh, the Gradle name on it. So feel free to come up, and if we run out, no big deal, I've got plenty more. Thanks.